Hey everyone, welcome to Plants and Politics. I have some updates to share about what's going on in Ukraine. Another talk was held between some Russian and Ukrainian leaders. Unfortunately, it ended again with no agreement, but Putin did say that he's willing to speak with Zelensky. So that's a bit of a of a push toward in the right direction. I guess you could say um, that news came right before it was announced that Ukrainian soldiers had ambushed a Russian tank convoy, and they were actually able to take out one of Russia's tank commanders in that attack. Meanwhile, some flooding was seen on satellite just outside of the country's capital of Kiev, and it may have been intentional and strategic, they're saying, on the part of Ukraine as a way to keep forces from advancing from Russia. Uh, but the mayor has said that approximately half of the residents have already fled the city. And then another recent report said that the governor of the Mikolaev, Mikolaev I'm not sure how you pronounce it, um, that region has established a hotline for Russian troops who, quote, haven't fired at civilians or committed any crimes yet. So what he's doing with this hotline is he's inviting these troops to call in and essentially turn themselves in. And he's saying, you know, you, you'll be able to stay alive. You won't have to face jail if you return to Russia. If you don't want to fight, this is your best option. So Putin remains defiant through all of this, um, even though he said he'll speak with Zelensky if necessary or if he wants to. He says they're going to overcome these sanctions that have been imposed. But then he also, in a meeting, told others that Russia, quote, cannot exist in such a miserable and humiliated state. He also falsely claimed in this meeting that the West would have imposed these sanctions regardless of whether or not he invaded Ukraine. He's also saying that, you know, that we have chemical weapons and putting the onus completely on America. Um, the U.S. is now warning that Putin could deploy chemical weapons in Ukraine and then try to use it as a false flag operation to blame the U.S., and say, oh, see, this is why we need to attack because the U.S. is killing them or even Ukraine, they could say, is using it against their own people. In the meantime, Russia, as you guys know, I told you yesterday, they bombed a maternity and children's hospital. Well, now it's been reported that in addition to the 17 injuries, it also caused three deaths, including the death of a child. Um, so they are absolutely committing war crimes. Russia claims without evidence that the hospital was being used by militia forces, but there are literally photos of pregnant women being carried out by stretchers, carried from the rubble. Um, and then their lie, this lie that, oh, it was being used by militia forces, this made complete fools out of their state-run media because their state-run media actor, who pretends to be a host every night, Vladimir Zoloviev, I believe is how you pronounce it, he alleged on his nightly show that the bombing was fake. Oh, nobody was injured. This is totally fake news. So which is it? It was either bombed because it was being used by militia, or there was no bombing and there was nobody injured. Sounds like the two Vladimirs need to get their two stories straight. And of course, Solaviv framed all of this as the war being perpetrated against Russia by the U.S. He is literally on his show saying that the U.S. is to blame for this. We are attacking Russia in some way, shape or form. And so that's why Russia is invading Ukraine. I mean, it's the most insane logic, if you can even call it that. It is unreal how these sociopaths can twist the truth and make themselves out to be the perpetual victims. And then they claim they don't like victims. Um, but other state media actors are actually going off script in the past couple of days. There was a great article in the Daily Beast about how some of them seem to be starting to panic. And so they're warning now that Russia has done enough 
they, they cited several examples over the past couple of days of some of these state run media hosts, actors saying that, you know, th this is it. We've done enough. We've done all we can. We just need to let Ukraine denazify, quote unquote, denazify their own country. So pretty stunning. They're they're all kind of calling for the end of this war and saying, you know, this this has gone on long enough. Russia has done what they can. So it's it, it is really interesting to see how quickly they've turned on this. And I think it's a sign of a growing number of Russian citizens feeling negative about the war and about the sanctions. And here's the thing. I keep hearing pundits and other people talking about how the Russian people are, they're used to suffering. They're used to going without. They've been through so much worse than this. They're not going to give in anytime soon. They're not going to rise up against Putin. That may be true for older Russian citizens, but I believe that the younger citizens who grew up with Western comforts are going to be shocked into reality. I think this is going to be a shock to the system for them. They don't know a world without iPhones or being able to, you know, walk down and grab a Big Mac at McDonald's. All of that is now gone with all of these companies fleeing Russia and refusing to do business with Russia. That's done. And, you know, their companies have never had to live in a world where they couldn't go and update their software for their computer systems. You know, it's much easier to live without when you don't know what you're missing. These younger generations, even the people in their, their 40s, their 50s, they don't know what it's like to live without. They were very young when the last war, Cold War, was going on and when they had to go without. So some of them may recall, but a lot of them won't have those recollections or they won't at least be able to feel it. They, they don't have the emotional connection to that time. So I have a lot of sympathy for them. You know, for many, this is not what they want. They don't agree with Putin's war in Ukraine. So I just wonder how bad it's going to have to get before there's a justified uprising in the country. But in the meantime, the mass exodus continues. Financial giant Goldman Sachs is now the first Wall Street bank to suspend business in Russia. I would imagine others are going to follow suit. And the seizure of assets also continues. Britain just announced that they're seizing all of the assets of Roman Abramovich. Um, he's a billionaire Russian oligarch. He's a Putin ally. And he holds property in the UK that's valued in the multi-millions in pounds. He's also the owner of the Chelsea Football Club, which is said to be worth billions of dollars. And he was recently trying to unload the team. He was trying to market it and sell it to some wealthy people he knows, but they were all saying, oh, he's asking way too much. There's no way I'm going to go for that. And they knew, you know, he was in trouble. They knew he was in a bad position. So they were just going to wait him out. Well, now it's too late because Britain says they're seizing all of those assets. Everything's going to be immediately frozen. So there, he cannot sell that team. All of his money is going to be frozen. His properties are going to be unavailable to him. And he's being barred from even entering the, the UK. So, oh, well. Um, and he's just one of several of Putin's oligarchs that have been hit with this new round of sanctions by the UK. The next bit of Ukraine news I want to share has to do with ugly Americans. Um, as a country, you know, we don't export a whole lot anymore. But one thing we do continue to export and probably always will is ignorance. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard about this idiot. He calls himself Comrade Texas. The guy's name is Russell Bonner Bentley III. Um, and he was seen on the front lines. He was standing in front of Russian tanks and he told reporters, quote, these guys are tough. These guys are ready, and there's plenty of them. He's referring to the Russians. 
And he said that Russia was, quote, ready to bring the hammer down on the bad guys. <laughs> this idiot actually believes, fully wholeheartedly believes that Russia is fighting Nazis in Ukraine and he's there to help. There are some Nazis in, in Ukraine. Even MSNBC showed some of them, unfortunately, and, you know, unbeknownst to them, in one of their segments not so long ago before the, the whole fighting start started. But there's Nazis here in the U.S. too. If the guy wants to fight Nazis, all he has to do is come back here and take on some of Trump's supporters, some of the literal Nazis living here in the U.S., who marched in Charlottesville, who just held a conference in Florida a couple of weeks ago. And Marjorie Taylor Greene was one of their featured speakers. And then she feigned ignorance. And, oh, I don't know what Nick Fuentes stands for. I don't know what he's all about. Really? There's this, there's this newfangled thing called Google. Go Google him. It's not that hard to figure out what Nick Fuentes is all about. So you guys won't be surprised to hear that this guy is wanted by the U.S. Marshal Service for some reason. Oh, and he spent time in prison in the past. Uh, the next ugly American is Republican lawmaker Madison Cawthorn, who clearly needs another at least 10 years of maturing before we can safely allow him out of his mommy's basement. On camera, Cawthorn was spewing out Russian talking points and slamming Ukraine. This just happened. He said, quote, remember that Zelensky is a thug. Remember that the Ukrainian government is incredibly corrupt and is incredibly evil and has been pushing woke ideologies. Was Ukraine corrupt? Hell yes. Hell yes. And they still have some issues that they need to deal with because of Russia, because of Russia's influence in the country. So, mm, yeah. I mean, seriously, why can't we just send people like this to Russia? If they think Putin is so great, Russia is such an awesome country, so perfect, go live in Russia, Cawthorn. Can we just pack up little baby Cawthorn? You know, maybe old Marge from Georgia can act like his chaperone on the flight. She can take him over there. <laughs> anyway. Last but not least, there was some late breaking news this afternoon that Russian forces have pushed closer to Kyiv. They're said to be about 37 miles away from the capital. Uh, not good. And the U.S. Pentagon says that 95 percent of Russian forces remain intact and they're planning to surround the capital city. This is not good, guys. This is going to be very bad. And here's the thing. I know Zelensky wants to stay with his people. He is, you know very proud. He's been very courageous through this whole thing. I know that he doesn't want to look like he's turning tail and running. But my thought is, if he is allowed to be captured, God forbid, killed, which is becoming very likely, it's going to have a psychological impact on the Ukrainian people. I think that he has been put on this pedestal in a way, and not that he doesn't deserve some of it. Um, like I said, he's been very courageous, but he's been put on this pedestal and he's kind of seen as this icon now. And, and he is seen as a symbol of the fight against Russia. I think that if they allow him to be captured and killed, I think it will deflate the Ukrainian people. I think it will be a very large, emotional, very deep emotional blow. And maybe people won't rally around the next person to step in and take charge. Like I said, if something should happen to Zelensky. So I just think it's best that if they do get too close, that he take off and he fight from afar, that he still activate his people um, that he still works with forces to continue the fight. But I think that if he is murdered by Putin, 
I think it will have a very negative effect going forward. Anyway, there was also news that Ukraine informed the United Nations that they're going to be recalling 308 military personnel that they had deployed on peacekeeping missions throughout the world. They're also going to be taking back military equipment that they had provided to others, and that includes eight helicopters. And you guys also may have heard by now that the whole Polish fighter jet idea was scrapped because it seems, you know, nobody wants to get stuck holding the hot potato. Poland doesn't want to be responsible for bringing the planes in, neither does the U.S., They don't want Putin to view it as an escalatory or aggressive measure by a NATO country. I get that. They've already given them so much, though. I mean, the Ukrainians. So I don't know if fighter jets are really going to be that much different. Um, But there are also logistical issues in actually getting them into Ukraine flying them in through contested airspace, you know, without getting shot down is an issue. Who's going to do that? Who's going to actually fly them in? So anyway, I'll keep you guys posted on that. I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent on that issue, but I will let you know as I hear more. Thanks so much for watching and listening. Take care and I'll talk with you soon. 